And there was only one story that's worth you dedicating your life to, and that is the Jesus story. We are honored to have Dr. Leonard Sweet here today. He's going to be bringing our message in just a moment. Uh, his full biography is there, but I think you'll see that he is a man of many pursuits and many talents. Not only a church historian and leading United Methodist theologian, but a pastor and also someone who studies culture and helps see things that are out there, emerging, things that are on their way, helping the church get ready for what lies ahead. Again, he is one of the most influential Christian thinkers out there, and we are blessed to have him this morning at Bluff Park United Methodist Church. Dr. Sweet. Good morning. morning. Praise to and peace, sisters and brothers, from the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. (laughs) Morning, choir. That was a wonderful anthem, by the way. It was really... Incredible. Can you all hear me all right? Are we, do we have some sound here? Is that, we got good? Okay. I, uh, I, I love the words of that anthem here. Um, new tasks today are ours who serve a world in pain. Calls to challenge all our powers of heart and hand and brain. We live in a deeply broken world. Broken nations. Broken systems. Broken churches. Broken children. Broken men. Broken women. Broken hearts. Broken minds. Broken lives. And there is only one hope for a world that is that broken. One hope for a broken world. This is the way life is. Broken. Jesus said, this is my body, what? Broken for you. This is the way life is. Poured out. But Jesus said, this is my blood. Poured out. Shed. Broken for you. The one hope for a broken world. Broken bread. And broken blood. Jesus himself said in his, some of his last words to us from the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. If you will open the door, I will and want to what? Come in, but it doesn't stop there. Come in and eat. Jesus is a foodie. Get over it. Okay? <laughs> when he comes in, he wants to break bread. He wants to share. Up. We live in a broken world that needs broken bread. Now the challenge for you, as you celebrate your 110th anniversary, I was reading your history, Mike, I couldn't believe, in 1912, first building went up in 12 days. Don't you wish we could build a building today in 12 days? I mean, just what, what ancestors we had. But you are 110, and that is the life expectancy what they're telling us, of those children that went out. In other words, this church right here today, you are norming and forming faith in 22nd century children. How you doing? 
But for my mother, the most important person in my life, her name was Marie All. She was born in 1897, and she died in 2005. In other words, she lived in what? Three centuries. Your children, a female born between 1990 and 2000, has a greater than 50% chance of living well into the 22nd century. A male or female born between 2000 and 2010 has a greater than 50% chance of living well into the 22nd century. A charge to keep we have for the 22nd century. How do we then break bread and pour out ourselves service to these 22nd century kids? Well, this is a kind of bread that's known as sourdough starter. Does anybody here have any sourdough starter in your refrigerator? Anybody? Have, okay, I see a couple of hands go up. Um, Amy, the photographer, has some. <laughs> the, um, I have a friend. I, I live in the Pacific Northwest on a little island called Orcas Island. If you ever saw the movie Free Willy, they shot the capture scene right off my deck. When I moved there, I wanted to kind of... I'm with people a lot, so when I, when I go home, I just wanted to be anonymous. So I said to my real estate agent when I bought the house 25 years ago, I said, I need at least one friend on this island, Al, and you're it. Now, we'd only met for about an hour, and he thought I was the strangest thing he'd ever seen. But he and I have become very good friends. And he's a great friend to have because he is a baker, and he loves to bake bread from his sourdough starter. He says he has sourdough starter from Alaska that is at least 150 years old. And he does not want anything change his sourdough starter. He is a fundamentalist about a sourdough starter. Don't add to it, don't mix it, don't sweeten it. I want the original Alaska sourdough starter. So let me just re- you know, go back here a little bit. He has a growing, living microorganism, bacteria, that's 150 years old in his refrigerator. He's got a 150-year-old creature living in his refrigerator. (laughs) I can't make it any more plain than that. And he's keeping it alive. You know how he keeps it alive? Because every day he does what? Bakes fresh bread. See, the mystery of life is this. In order for things to stay the same, they have to what? Change. You're alive right now because your body's changing. You stop changing, you die. Medical definition of death, the body that does not change. So there's this paradox in life. By the way, the moment we're born, we begin to die. The moment we die, we begin to live for eternity. I mean, it's just this huge paradox about life and death and change. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but only if he becomes fresh every morning, like sourdough starter. You use what is there... That sourdough starter to bake fresh bread. Now, he, he can bake any kind of bread. I mean, someday he leaves at my house uh, some pumpernickel bread. Sometimes he leaves some pita bread. I mean, he, lo- he loves to experiment with his sourdough starter. He does all sorts of kinds of bread. Challah bread is one of my favorites. That's a Jewish... You can bake all kinds of bread from that same sourdough starter. Don't mess with the sourdough starter. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's always the same. But it's always what? Changing. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he's con- the content <laughs> stays the same, but the containers change. And let's be clear about what that content is. Content is the bread. Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus, the cup of salvation. And our mission, and your mission, as you serve 22nd century kids, 
to break fresh bread out of that same sourdough starter. Now, when Jesus was a child in the first century, every child, male child, first century, every male child at age six went through a course of study. It was called Bet Safer. B-E-T means house of, S-E-F-E-R, book. House of book. Bet Safer. Can you all say that? Bet Safer. Yeah. And at six, if you were a Jewish male, at six years of age, you were enrolled in a house of book, meaning from the rabbis and scribes and Pharisees and, and teachers and your father, you learned as much as you could. You memorized the first five books of the Bible. I repeat, at age six, from six to ten, your job as a Jewish male was to, what did I say? Memorize. First five books. You were not expected to understand it. You were not expected to question it. You were just to, and the words are, Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart. And so the job of every Jewish child in Jesus' day was to get the word into the heart. Doesn't mean you have to understand it. Doesn't mean you have to know what the words mean. But your job is to get them inside you. That word goes inside. Now that word, however, we hear word, we hear words. But in the Jewish culture, it's not words, it's a story. So from age six, you got the story of the first five books of the Bible. The Torah. At age ten, you left Bet Safer and went to Bet Talmud, House of Learning, Bet Talmud. Can you all say that? Bet Talmud, yeah. And so from 10 until 14, your job as a Jewish child, seven days a week, was to move from the first five books of the Bible, and actually some Jewish children had memorized the entire first five books of the Bible by the time they were 10. At age 10, then you went to the prophets. So you went from Torah to Talmud. And you were to memorize as much of the prophets as you could. But now, at age 10, is when you began to question and learn what kind of questions and to come to comprehend and understand what is all that is unique about your story. So from 10 to 14, you learned the whole story. Torah and Talmud. You learned the first five books, the law. You learned the prophets. Didn't. And so you began to integrate this story into who you were as a child of Israel. At age 14, it was a huge juncture in your life. The very best who had understood and comprehended and remember the scene of Jesus in the synagogue? That's what we're talking about here. The very best of the students would then decide that they wanted to enter what was called Bet Midrash, house of study. Can you all say that? Bet Midrash. Bet, yeah. So we went to Bet Safer, Bet Talmud, Bet Midrash. Most everybody, most every Jewish child at 14, which is when you were an adult, um, would take on the trade of their father and have economic responsibilities for bringing in the bacon, as we say. So, but there were a few, the very best of the best, that went to Bet Talmud, house of study. But they had to convince a rabbi to take them on. And so rabbis put on what would be the equivalent of first century survivor games. And so they would test these students that wanted to be their, their, their student, and they would put them through paces, and they would see how much of the story they really knew and how integrated that story was into their life. And the few that got chosen were bet Midrash had a ticket for life. They'd won the lottery ticket, because they were now the elite, and they would study for that rabbi from 14 till, you can guess it now, 30. 
14 to 30, you were in Bet, Midrash. And at 30, after you'd spent all those years doing everything that rabbi did, learning how that story became real in his life in every way. You shadowed that rabbi. Every rabbi had a different walk, and so you learned his walk, and you learned to walk like he did. You could look through the streets and see who was a student of what rabbi because they had this certain walk. And, and at 30, it's like our equivalent of a Ph.D., you then could become a teacher yourself and take on students, which is what Jesus did with his time to take on disciples. After his mother kept calling him out. <laughs> his time. So we have here a model that Jesus would have followed as to how to move into the future. Now, just so we exercise a little discipline of historical context here, 30 in the first century is our equivalent of 60. Repeat. 30 the first century, is our equivalent of what age? 60. So when Jesus got the equivalent of 60, his question was not where do I retire, but now time to save the world. Not a bad question for all of us. Time to save the world. Time to save the future. Time to save our culture. So I challenge you, as you think about your future here together, future of these 22nd century kids, with this question, how well do we know the story? How well do we know our own story? I'm staying downtown Birmingham at the West End, and there's a convention going on called Comic-Con or something. It's Everybody's dressed up in all these comic characters. Anybody seen this? It's an experience. <laughs> I get on the elevator, and I never know who's going to join me in that elevator. <laughs> I get the most, because all these kids are looking for an identity. They're looking for, i got to find an identity, so let me try this character, and let me try this character. So they're all searching for an identity based on this character and that character, and everybody's in a hung hunger for an identity. We're in identity crisis. Because we have not taught our kids and ourselves that your identity is found in Christ. And there is only one story that's worth you dedicating your life to, and that is the Jesus story. Because you can't build an identity on anything else. You can't build an identity on views, values, Virtues, verses, no, it takes, you can only, identity requires narrative form, and you find that narrative around a table as the people gather and break bread together. That's what companion means, panera. Bread, come, with, bread, with. Next week you're going to watch the Super Bowl. There's two competitions going on. Football one, and then there's a commercial one. And I want you to notice next week, I want to haunt you with these words, watch every commercial. Nobody's selling a product. They're all selling a story. And the one with the best story wins. And let me tell you, we've got the best story. But do we know our own story? Have we spent the time learning our story? The story of those four Gospels that are on your stained glass window as you leave this sanctuary. The greatest story never told. Because we don't know it is a story. We know it is views and values and verses. You know, a guy named John Calvin is the one that sliced and diced the Bible up into verses. Bible wasn't written in verses, it was written in poems and hymns and letters and stories. So the hope for a broken world. A world with broken systems, broken nations, broken churches, breakdowns all around us. 
one hope. Broken bread. Broken blood. A whole world from that brokenness. Your mission and mine for the power of this bread and this wine to break evil. Break the power of evil to break the power of bad. Breaking bad, anybody? Break that power. Break bread. Broken world. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for history of this church for its first 110 years as it looks forward to its next 110. Lifetime of some of its children. Oh God, I pray that you would reintroduce to us the story, that we may begin to live the story, that we may only allow you to author our story, not some celebrity or not some, some commercial brand. This culture is trying to build its identity on, Lord, our identity is found in you, in Christ. May we live your story. Break bread for a broken world, I pray in Jesus' name.